Yeah, I'll uh, open with, you know, this is our uh, senior day, our uh, seniors' uh, last uh, home game, and they've done a tremendous job for our program, and uh, I'm excited to see these guys and uh, would love to see their family, but we don't get to do the traditional senior day uh, routine, but uh, we'll get to bring the players out and uh, hopefully our fan base will turn out and, and be there the right way to kind of support these guys because I know it'll mean a lot to these guys for our last home game. And then um, moving on to Vandy, I was unfortunate to get the news about uh, Derek uh, yesterday. He's become a good friend. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of respect for his profession, the job he's always done uh, with his units when he was at Stanford. And, and they play, they have always played so hard at Vandy and uh, I've gotten to know him in the off season and uh, taking a trip uh, together with some other coaches um, with he and his uh, wife and uh, got a lot of respect for Derek and I know the future will be bright for him because he'll have a lot of opportunities uh, moving forward because he's a really good football coach. Hey, let's uh, start with the questions. We'll uh, start with Seth Emerson and then uh, Anthony Dasher. Kirby, uh, obviously, You've said before that special teams, Scott Cochran doesn't handle it by himself by any measure. But still, the way it's gone, does it kind of validate that this move you made, which so, was so outside the box in this arrangement, worked? Well, I, I mean, the verdict's always out on that. I, the job he's done has been tremendous. And I think the greatest impact that he has on our organization is not through special teams. And I knew that when I wanted to hire him, the greatest impact he has is on the the young men that are in the organization in terms of daily impact, uh, life skills, uh, support. And uh, during the COVID time, the 2020 time, which is very different, I think it's been an even exponentially better hire because he is tremendous at his relationships with the players. Uh, he's played a, a large part in our leadership group, which is – have been a tremendous help to me um, in terms of being able to spend time with those guys and talk to guys. And the special team skill set is almost like he's developing in that area. So his energy and his passion's there, and he's always liked to do it. But I didn't think that I was getting a, a finished product that was going to know everything about special teams. He's going to grow. He's grown. He's gone and met and learned and educated himself and has coaches all over our staff who've coached it. So he's done a fantastic job of putting the pieces in place to be successful on the units. Now, fortunately, we have a really good uh, punter. We have a, a good kicker. Uh, and we put our best players out there that have helped us be good uh, statistically, but not where we need to be. You know, the big emphasis last week was, hey, punt returns lagging behind. And uh, we cranked it up on punt return and did a better job. Good morning or afternoon, Coach. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, Two quick little two-parter for you. You know, being in this uh, senior week, seniors will be honored. Have uh, any seniors indicated to you with a new NSA blanket waiver that they may be considered coming back for another year? And also, uh, word today that Dewan did put a name to transfer portal and just kind of comment on that and what it means to, to lose a guy like him. Yeah, we're excited uh, about the senior day and just really – Big, big week for them because it's their last chance to have a home game. Uh, as far as those conversations, we don't really have a lot of those conversations. Um, as far as the return, they've got the opportunity to do that. Uh, each kid is in a different scenario. Some, you know, senior bowl invites, some uh, opportunity to grow and get better, uh, some an opportunity to graduate. So we don't, we, don't, we don't really get into it right now. We're concerned with Vanderbilt and we'll worry about that. Uh, kind of when the regular season ends. Uh, and then as far as DeJuan goes, like I said the other night, he's handled everything first class. Every conversation he's had with me has been the right way. He didn't want to be a distraction for the team. And he was very hurt and disappointed that, you know, things came out before the game uh, about that. And he, he that bothered him because he didn't want to be a distraction for the team. He wanted to handle it the right way and he wanted it to come out uh, today when, when he entered the portal. And that's exactly what he asked and that's what we did. Um, and I'm excited to see his future. He's going to be a really good football player, and we want him to stay here. You know, there's no doubt we want him to stay here. We've encouraged him to stay here, but I also respect that that's his decision, and we're going to help him every way we can with the transition, and uh, I think he's, going to, he's got a bright future. And let's go to Dean Leggy and then Mike Griffith. 
Kirby, you married a, a, a woman who played sports in college. Did Sarah, uh, did uh, Mary Beth talk with you or mention anything about Sarah Fuller kicking number one? And then number two, what, what do you think the impact of sports has been on Mary Beth and other women that you've known uh, in you know college now and, and since? Well, I think, uh, I think they, they have the opportunity to go compete now more than ever but it's still not where it should be. And when you see uh, a young woman like Sarah do what she did Saturday, it, it's so many hopes and dreams of so many young girls uh, hang on that. You know, I've got a daughter that, that absolutely loves sports. She loves basketball because her mom played basketball and she's gotten that opportunity because of people like Teresa Edwards and all the, the, the people who come out and played basketball for so long and made it okay to, to compete hard, to sweat, to dive, to be physical, to be aggressive, to be competitors. And I think Sarah carries on that tradition with the way she uh, goes about things and, and what she's not afraid to do. You know, not worried about what somebody's going to say. If she's got a chance to help the team or contribute, then by all means, go do it. I didn't have any conversations with my wife about it because she was out of town this weekend, and obviously I was out of town. So we didn't, we didn't talk about it much. Kirby, uh, I know you were talking the other night about, you know, Mike Bobo not wanting any pity, things like that. But we're at the end of the season and we're seeing some teams missing players, injuries, COVID-19, opt-outs. Obviously, this Georgia team you've got uh, has the potential to score a lot of points. What is there to be said about coaching etiquette? I mean, you see Alabama putting 60 on Kentucky. I mean, are we in an age right now where you just let your offense go and score as many points? Or is there still something to be said for – taking a knee and trying to run out the clock in the fourth quarter? Well, I, I don't know if that's a fair assessment because I, I, I didn't watch the Alabama game, but I, I've been on the headphones with Coach Saban. I got a lot of respect for him, and there's many a time that he has said, hey, that guy on the other sideline is uh, a coach too, and he's worked for me or I know him, and, and he's, he's, he's made decisions to take meals. So but what you're not going to do is tell your guys to not go out there and compete and get better. And we were able to do that. You know, we had a drive there that took however many minutes off the clock. And Dejon Edwards got a lot of work. And a lot of five offensive linemen who have already got to play this year got to go out and play. And a couple of wideouts got to go out there and play. And tight ends of freshmen. So, you know, I look at it as we weren't going down the field not trying to score. We were trying to score. Um, but at some point, it would, the game can be ended by a kneel. You get an opportunity to do that. It doesn't matter if that was on the minus one or the plus one. When, when you can take a meal and end the clock, not have to run other plays, then you move on from it. I do think there's times where you got to try to get your team better and get continuity. Uh, and, you know, we, we did that. I mean, we, we, we threw the ball to Arian uh, in a situation that we didn't have to. Um, so we, we want to continue to grow our team and, and get better. Let's go to Chip Towers and then Mark Weiser. Yeah, Coach, uh, talking about those seniors, obviously Richard LeCount is one of them. Um, you know, any chance of seeing him this week, even just, I guess, for posterity's sake, uh, you know, but uh, I, I know his health is number one. And then, you know, as long as we're kind of updating that, uh, any, any chance Jordan Davis uh, gets to come out and play in this game? Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful on both those guys. I'm hopeful to get them back. Uh, so there's a chance that, that Richard could get back. Um, I don't know how realistic it is for this week, but he's – doing more. He's running now and um, he's with us and he's back into things. So there's a chance he could get out there and play by this week and, and, and hopeful that Jordan can as well. Can you talk just a second about Richard, about what he, he's meant to you uh, uh, since he's been here? Yeah. I mean, he was, I, I, I don't know if I'm correct in saying this. I think he was the very first commitment that, uh, that I received upon getting the job. Uh, now he was for the next season. He was an early commit, but um he was one of the first ones. I mean, I, I still remember the day that he was an eighth or ninth grader and he visited Alabama with uh, Raekwon McMillan and he came over and, uh, and I got to meet him then. And the personality was just uh, so infectious. Uh, he, and the whole time that I recruited Raekwon, I got to know Richard and uh, that relationship carried over when I got the head job here. And he was one of the first to jump on board and just, I think the guy's been so loyal to Georgia in a time, in an era when that's not normal. You know, it's, it's normal to decommit, move here, decide late. He committed early. He was a great player. He stayed an extra year, senior year, and uh, he loves the University of Georgia. And uh, I think that's that makes somebody special. And 
uh, people remember that for the rest of his life. Thank you. Kirby, uh, since it's the final home game of the season, I want to ask you about underclassmen. Uh, is that an ongoing conversation with them in, in terms of the NFL? Is it a different conversation this year about plans given the COVID environment and, and players opting out increasingly? No, not really. I mean, we gather information on these guys based on uh, how they play, um, what's going on, how many, what the pool is at their position. Uh, try to be very honest with them. Don't get emotional about it. We're not recruiting them like people will say. They're, that's the decision that they have to make. What we want is to arm them with information. And I say the same thing every year. We're going to give you the information to make the best decision possible. Ultimately, you have to make the best decision possible. What value do you put on a degree? What value do you put on preparation? Because 100%, the higher you get drafted, the longer you're able to stay. So ultimately, we want these kids to get drafted as high as possible. And if there's value in coming back because they cannot develop in that league, there is no practice reps, there is no possibly no combine, there is no come into OTAs and I'm going to get you better. You're there and you're going to be good enough or you're not. And we can still develop players. And every general manager, every scout you talk to says, if you're going to have someone grow and get better, they're much better doing it in your organization than ours because they don't have the freedom to – uh, get them better. So we don't have a lot of those conversations right now. We've had a few, but we don't have those conversations because we want the kids to focus on being uh, student athletes and playing out our season. Let's go to Jake Rowe and then Jed May. Hey, Kirby. Uh, when, when Arian Smith, you know, you mentioned that touchdown pass that he caught and, and, you know, he battled his way back, I think was injured a couple times for you guys, but had that one big surgery. What what went into him kind of earning that opportunity and, and, you know, how excited were you for him to get a chance to make a play like that after kind of toiling and, and, and battling back from an injury like that before things ever really got started? Uh, he's worked hard. I mean, he's, he's earned the right. I mean, we, he, he, he thought all along he would be ready for Florida. We didn't know if he'd be ready for the Florida game. And um, he, he got cleared somewhere around that week, but clearing doesn't make, doesn't make you ready to play. I mean, he had not, you know, stopped, come out of a break, caught balls. There's a lot of things he wasn't able to do. So he's been working really hard. Um, he stays after practice. He gets extra throwing. Um, you know, we don't, we don't have enough uh, depth to get all the guys the work they want because we can't be out on the practice field but for so long. So he stays extra, gets, gets extra throwing. He learning routes, learning the offense. Um, you know, I'm very pleased with his work ethic and his attitude. And he's just a – Really, like, I want to do whatever I can do to help the team coach, whatever it is. If that's special teams, then I'll do it. And uh, it was great to see him get to make a play after coming back from injury like that. Uh, Kirby, you've mentioned this senior class a lot, um, especially in this season where, you know, there's so much uncertainty over the summer and, you know, it would have been easy for, for older guys like that to opt out. What have they meant to this team and sort of, I guess, keeping things on track throughout this whirlwind of a season? Well, they've been the glue. I mean, it, and it's not easy for them to opt out. I mean, I guess you could say it's a, a, an avenue to get out, but that, that's, that's not – it's not ever – I mean, to me, in life, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to opt out of that. I mean, you you, you, you got to go out and compete and work and, and challenge yourself, and that's what these kids have done. They've done it for each other. They've stuck together. Uh, they've done a really good job thus far of – uh, maintaining the social distance, keeping them washing hands and, and not having major issues uh, thus far in our organization. And I appreciate the guys that have done that and the people that have helped them. But the senior class has been the glue to that. Um, they work really hard each day. And, you know, I think they want to leave a legacy of being the winningest senior class to ever come out of here. And uh, that's, that's a feather they want to stick in their hat. And they got it to do that. They've got to finish this thing off right. Let's go to Charles Odom and then uh, Zach Klein. As we're um, approaching the, the end of the regular season, can you just reflect on um, the trials and, and maybe the uh, surprises and disappointments of how you guys have, have uh, made it through the, you know, going through a pandemic season? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, it's just day in, day out. I mean, I, you, maybe a more specific question because I can't even – it seems like it's been a, a year or two years within the last eight months. I mean, it's just been a lot of stuff going on. But uh, our kids have handled it well. The support in our organization have supported the kids. And 
Uh, I'm really pleased with how hard these guys have worked and continue to work and the attitude they have when they come over each day because it's not like that everywhere. I mean, when you talk to people, it's, um, you know, you don't have a, a great attitude at work when things aren't going your way or people are opting out. We, we haven't had a lot of those issues. Kirby, Ben Cleveland was once again named the uh, SEC's Offensive Lineman of the Week, another senior for you. What's, uh, I guess, been the biggest change you've seen from a wide-eyed redshirt freshman a few years ago to now uh, an emerging you know, star in SEC football on the O-line? Experience. You can't put a value on experience. You know, that's what people don't understand is everybody wants the freshman O-lineman to be the best and the five-star to come in. But on the offensive line, there, I mean, the number of times he's seen – games and pass off and twists. He knows what they're going to do before they do it. Uh, he's got great size. Um, I think he's played more physical this year. He's had a lot uh, better attitude and commitment to being a good player. Um, I think he went through some spells last year where he would probably admit that he wasn't at his best. Um, and he's been, he's, it's been, it's been more meaningful to him this year. He's played better. Uh, he's been a really good leader for that unit. Uh, he's been a tremendous leader for our team. And he's got a bright future. I mean, he's, he's a guy that, that, you know, didn't like the information he got last year. And uh, I think he's going to like the information he gets this year better in terms of where he is in terms of NFL prospect. Let's go uh, David Pascal and then uh, Connor Riley. Kirby, a couple of quick ones for me. Um, you're obviously facing your second interim coach in as many weeks. I know you can't reinvent the wheel, in, in seven days, but, but do you tend to see wrinkles in these type of situations? Did you see new stuff from Mike, and do you expect to see some new stuff this week? No, you don't have time to – I mean, there's only so much you can do in a week. So just finding out yesterday, the, the biggest thing you sometimes see is a jump in energy or enthusiasm because you got a new voice. You know, you got somebody new up there. Maybe you reach a kid that, that, that wasn't being reached before. Um, and he, he plays harder or better because of maybe a better relationship with that coach. But you're not going to see a lot of uh, change in scheme. You may see uh, possibly more enthusiasm, um, but I don't know that. I don't know the relationship they have with uh, their OC there. And then the other thing I had is I know it's your job to run Georgia's program, but this is now two changes in the SEC. Given the financial landscapes at every school, are, are you surprised coaching changes are being made this season at all? Yeah, I don't have an opinion on that. I mean, it's not my field. Okay, let's go, to, a, uh, let's go oh, to Roddy, sorry. and then uh, we'll go to Justin Felder. I think you had Connor dialed up. Oh, Connor? Yeah. I'm sorry, Connor, yeah. go ahead. Oh, good. Um, having a chance to review the tape uh, of JT's performance against South Carolina, what have you seen from him in the first two games, and what are you looking for him to improve on over the rest of the 2020 season? Uh, good decision-making. That's the most important thing, to continue to make good decisions. And uh, if it's not there, uh, take off and run with it, throw it away, which he did the other day. He threw it away one time. And there's going to be times that you don't have the perfect call or maybe they got the perfect defense into a call. And, hey, you got to punt. You got to throw it away. Um, and that's what I want to see him do and continue to get better at. Okay, let's go to Roddy, and then we'll see if Justin has a question. Uh, two quick ones for me as well, Kirby. Uh, can you give us an update on Mark Webb? We were kind of going over the uh, snap count and didn't see him uh, play. I don't remember seeing him in the game this past weekend. And if you would, kind of break down the Demetrius Robertson recruitment with him going to Cal, then you inviting him back, and what you've seen from him this year. Uh, Mark was just dinged up a little bit, and uh, we did, he could have played and weren't going to play him unless we had to or maybe we had some other injuries because um, we've been thin at the DB position and uh, didn't have to. Uh, play him, so we didn't and think he'll be back this week. Um, in terms of Demetrius D. Rob, um, you know, he's another one that I had recruited for a long time, had a good relationship with. Uh, Coach Schumann had a good relationship with from our time at Alabama. He had been over there. Um, we continued that relationship once we got at Georgia, uh, got to know his uh, family really well, and um, he, you know, he made a decision to go to Cal, and we, we were very honest and forthright and said, hey, congratulations. Um, we're here for you. Keep in touch and good luck. And he went out there and decided he wanted to get closer to home. And so, you know, reached out to us and, and decided to come back. And he's done nothing but work hard. And he's a kid that, you know, probably came in with unrealistic uh, expectations 
which I think is so unfair and causes these kids so much undue unrest because what happens is all the people around them, all the support elements they have, their family, friends, put this pressure on them and, and, and D-Rob did nothing to, to, to deserve that or have anything up. And all he does is work really hard for us. Um, and he's a good football player and been really helpful. Uh, and even more recently started to make some more plays and we hope he continue to do that. Justin, do you have a question? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to unmute. Hey, Kirby, wanted to ask you uh, what you've seen out of the Vanderbilt quarterbacks. They got a couple uh, freshmen back there, and in particular, uh, Mike Wright, guy from uh, from Atlanta, doesn't have a huge role, but has been kind of a change of pace quarterback. Yeah, I think both those quarterbacks are going to be good players. You know, Mike, we looked at last year um, late in the recruiting process and thought a lot of him. He went on a, an unbelievable run and had one of the the best closing of senior seasons that I've seen a kid have uh, in, in a long time in terms of making plays and big games and uh, he's a really good player and they, they do a good job developing him by giving him a role and getting him in the game. I think they do a tremendous job of doing that. And then the Seals kid has been tremendous too. He's great with the RPO game. Um, I mean, to be in our league and play as a freshman at that position is in and of itself pretty hard to do. And uh, those guys are doing it and, and doing it well. And, you know, they, they may not have as many weapons around them as some of the other freshman quarterbacks do, but they do a great job offensively of keeping people off balance, using tempo um, to see how they started the game against uh, Florida. They did a really nice job. We've got time for one more question. Anyone want to jump in? Hey, Kirby. Hey, John, uh, I'll do that real, real quick. Everybody's going to talk about – everybody likes to talk about the, the run game stats from last game and how much you guys ground and pounded it. But, you know, with the RPOs and the, and the package plays, how big of a role did JT play in his decision-making and, and that being what it was? Because it seemed like there were a lot of plays where he could have pulled it and threw it, but it made just more sense to, to go straight ahead with it like you guys were doing because it was so uh, – because the numbers and the defense dictated it. Yeah, he, he, there was – I mean, he had some RPOs that he actually threw, um, and, and it, some were complete and some weren't. But, you know, some, some of the looks uh, – were advantageous for the RPO, meaning that they had too many in the box. But we don't have to attach RPOs to all of them, just like everybody in college football doesn't. If you're having success running the ball with an extra hat in, you don't have to call the RPO. You know, you don't have to throw the RPO because there's bad things that can happen, balls batted, things like that, and you, you could have got five yards on a run. So you have to weigh out what your success ratio is on extra people in the box versus throwing the ball. I mean, if you give JT the choice every time, he's going to probably pull it and throw it. But if you're having success running the ball, you don't have to do the other. So it wasn't more that they dictated anything. It was more that, that hey, it was what was working, and that's what we stuck with. We certainly have confidence in JT to be able to throw the ball. Thanks, Coach Smart. Thanks, everyone.